Yeah, we're going to be talking through, talking through uh, unsupervised learning. And unsupervised learning, again, is where you're letting the data speak for themselves rather than um, having trying to predict something or predict some labels. You just have, have the data set and you want to learn something about it. We'll start out with this dimensionality reduction. We'll go into clustering and then into density estimation. And I'll try to talk about where each of these are, are useful in the data mining process. And um, feel free to ask questions along the way. So let's start out with, with dimensionality reduction. So we, we saw this briefly earlier. A dimensionality reduction is something that can be really useful for visualizing data because if you have if you have very high dimensional data, it's often hard to plot. You know, how do you plot 60 dimensions against each other and figure out how the points are related? So dimensionality reduction is a way to um, to help with that. So let's take a look at what I did, how I did this, um, reducing this depth dimensionality. We have the uh, the principal component analysis, and this time, instead of saying that I want two components, I passed it a floating point value. And what this says is that um, I'm asking for I'm asking for the result that contains 95% of the variance of the data. So, you, in some senses, roughly, you can think about this as like I want to I want 95% of my information in the data to be preserved in this projection. And it automatically chooses how many components you need for 95% of that variance. So what it actually does is it, it compares this, the length of this vector to the length of that vector and converts that into sort of a, a fractional, fractional variance across the data set. And when we say that we want 95, then we can and then fit, the, uh, fit the data. We can actually print um, clf.n components and um, the output number of components is one. So it's going through here, and from the data itself, it's told us that if we want 95% of the information to be retained in this data set, what you need is one component, and then you can, you can print that out, and we, we invert, inverse transform the data, and we get out this one-dimensional representation of our data. So this is a little bit abstract. It's probably hard to, hard to think about how this applies to real data. But essentially, well, we'll see an example. But essentially, it's just a way of describing describing a high-dimensional data set in a smaller smaller uh, set of parameters. Um, we were looking at that all the, all these numbers like this, or right, the, the digits. So this is this is sixty-four dimensional data because. Each, each image has 8 by 8 pixels, and each pixel level is some number. And if you have a 64-dimensional axis, each of those digits is just a point in the 64-dimensional space. And so thinking of it that way, we have, we have the 64-dimensional data, and we want to reduce it down to a smaller number of dimensions. Um, let's take, take a look at doing this with PCA. So we have the digits.data, digits.target, and just to look at the shape of the X, this is 1,797 by 64, so this is whatever, 1,800 points in 64 dimensions. And here we're going to say we want to project this down to two dimensions. So we're going to take, you know, we're going to, we're going to take the components, project them down to two, and then just like we did up here where we projected the data into this kind of lower dimensional representation in the original space, here we'll project our data with the fit transform form into this two-dimensional two -dimensional representation of the digits data. And we get that out. And now taking a look at some of the, uh, of the at these two dimensions, this is what it looks like. So um, each each dimension here is some linear combination of the pixel values. It's some, you can think about it as taking this cloud and rotating it and squishing it down in, in 62 out of the 64 dimensions. But the question of, of what, these, what these principal components mean, um, so let's see, think, think of it this way. Um, if, we, if we go back up to this picture, this picture right here, Imagine we have a two-dimensional spectrum, right? So a two-dimensional spectrum is a point on this two-dimensional plane. And um, 
So any vector in this two-dimensional plane represents a spectrum, right? And we can create, we can recreate any of the points in this plane by adding some linear combination of that vector and that vector. We're going to add these together. So what we're saying is that we're, we're recreating each of these points by adding together some fundamental, uh, some fundamental components. So we say, you know, it's, it's a little bit of this, it's a little bit of that. We can interpret it as like a spectrum is a little bit of O star and a little bit of uh, G star. And when you add those together, you get the resulting spectrum. So these, these vectors in this, in this space are actually, can, can be considered like pieces of data, can be considered components of your data. So if we look at the, at here, I'm, I'm mixing analogies a little bit, but if we look here at the, um, oh yeah, PCA is, is data compression. Um, where do I show that? Yeah, so if we, if we look here at the digits, this is, this is what happens with one of our digits that we're looking at as we add more components. So here's a, a digit that we've reduced down to one dimension. So we've taken those 64 and we've crushed it down to one dimension and then reconstructed it. And this is kind of like, this is sort of like the average digit that we're looking at right here. And here's what happens if we use two components. We add a little more information to it. A little, here's three, a little more, four, five. You can see as we add these components to the digit, it goes up and eventually um, we get something that looks, this is the real result right here when we've reconstructed everything using all the, all the data. But we can see that we, we basically get the real result somewhere around, I don't know, 12 or 13. At this point we're doing well enough that it's hard to distinguish between the low dimensional representation and the full dimensional representation. So this is a, a sense of what, what the components mean, right? We're, we're, um, we have this low dimensional representation and we can re reconstruct using less information. We can reconstruct what these objects look like. So one way to, one way to, to quantify this, to quantify how many of components you need in order to get something that's representative, is to plot this explained variance ratio. So after you do the fit, you have this, this thing that's explained variance ratio that adds up to one. And what that tells you is a function of the number of components, how much of the total variance in the data set is preserved in this projection. So we can see here that if we had 10 components, we've preserved maybe 75% of the variance. If we had 20 components, we've preserved 90% of the variance. And if we go all the way up to 40 components, we're essentially at 99%. Um, so it's a way of, of squishing down our data so that we don't need all the information. We only need a little bit of the information to, to reconstruct. And this is actually, I made this nice little interactive thing here where we're looking at a, at a whole sample of objects and asking as a function of the number of components, what do they look like? Um, thing, but you can see, yeah, as we're, as we're adding components, we have, at 40 components, we have 99% of the variance, so we're basically reconstructing the, the digits perfectly, right? Here's 100% of the variance, that's what they look like, and if we go down to, to 30, we have 90% of the variance, so we're, we're basically, we're reducing the dimensionality without losing much information. And it's amazing to me that if you go down to even just nine, ten components, you can already see what these are. You're already getting 75% of the variance, and you already learn a lot about the data. So where this becomes interesting in, in astronomy in particular, um, rather than doing this in the notebook, I'm going to pull up uh, a web page, astro and all the word. This is all our, uh, our book figures right here. What, where this becomes interesting is in looking at, at spectra. So I told you that each principal component, in the case of these digits, each principal component can be thought of as like some eigen digit that, that contributes to the total amount. With spectra, you can think of each individual principal component as an eigen spectrum that contributes to the whole. So if you look at the principal components of the Sloan-Dibble-Sky-Survey spectra, you have this, 
Component one is a mean spectrum. And component two is something you have to either add or subtract from the mean to approach a real spectrum. Same, or component one, I should say. Component two is another thing that you add or subtract from the mean. You add or subtract this from the mean. You add or subtract this from the mean. And eventually, you, you end up with a spectrum that, that represents, represents your data. Here's, here's an example of a PCA, a single spectrum that we're reconstructing. This, uh, this black line here is the true spectrum, and this is what happens if you take the, take the mean of all spectra, that's what it looks like. Once you add the, the first four components, it's getting closer to the true spectrum. Once you add the first eight components, it's getting even closer, and when you add 20 components, you basically can't tell the difference between the, the true and the reconstructed. So think about what this means. This, this right here, this 20 component model, is a 20 dimensional representation of a 4,000 dimensional object. So we've reduced the number of dimensions in the spectra by uh, two orders of magnitude. And even with that reduction of information, we can, still, um, we can still reconstruct it. So one thing, if you look through the literature, one thing PCA is used for is um, the the principal components tend to be less uh, influenced by noise, so a lot of this, a lot of this random, random stuff that's been dropped out in this representation of noise. So there's a great paper by uh, Chinghua Yip that looks at a series of papers actually that look at principal component analysis of Sloan galaxy spectra and Sloan quasar spectra, and it goes through all this, all these arguments about the, the interesting things you can do with, um, with spectra like this. Yeah. How much does the time control depend on the number of components? That's a good question. So, how, how fast is it depending on the number of components? Uh, it, it depends which algorithm you use. Um, if you use. Is this the one I'm looking at? Yeah. So, there's this uh, down here. If, if you use uh, PCA, then it's basically. It's, it scales as the number of points in your data set squared. And um, actually, n number of points cubed, something like that. So it's, it's slow as n increases. But um, it, it essentially, you don't, you don't buy anything by doing a smaller, smaller projection. This one, the randomized PCA, is a more efficient algorithm that um, scales much better. But, um, and it also, if you only want to compute two components, it does it much more quickly. So it depends on the implementation. If you look at the, the scikit-learn um, documentation on this, it'll, it'll go into the details of why, of how slow or how fast these algorithms are. So that's, that's principal component analysis. Um, does that sort of make sense, what we're doing? We're trying to reduce the dimensionality of data. It's a little bit confusing because there are all these ways to look at things. We can look at points in the reduced dimensionality space to find the relationships between them. We can look at the variance to figure out the intrinsic dimensionality of the data. We can look at, um, we can look at the reconstructions to see you know, how well we're reconstructing our points. And this is one of the reasons that PCA is so valuable as a tool because it lets you see all these different things that are going on in your data. You can also, as I showed you, you can look at the, you can look at the reconstructions or you can look at the, um, what we call the eigenvectors here, the components that tell you a little bit about what it is that makes up the spectrum. So all, all of those are interesting ways to look at data, but 